So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our author. Thank you so much, Maria, for joining us today. Thank you. And, and I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, our author. Uh, Dr. Marie Helene Maras is an associate professor at the Department of Security, Fire and Emergency Management and the director of the Center for Cybercrime Studies at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, she holds degrees in law uh, and in criminology and criminal justice from the University of Oxford, as well as graduate and undergraduate degrees from the University of New Haven and UMUC. Her academic background and research cover cybersecurity, cybercrime, and the legal, political, social, cultural, and economic impact of digital technology. She is the author of numerous peer-reviewed academic journal articles and books, including Cyber Criminology, which is the book, of course, we'll be looking at today, as well as some of her other research. Um, she serves currently as a consultant and subject matter expert on cyber crime and cyber organized crime at UNODC. So for some of our colleagues, you might already be familiar with, um, with Maria. So again, Maria, thank you so much for joining us. Um, as some of you might be aware, we are uh, moving towards developing a cyber crime convention. So this is very timely and uh, we're very excited to hear what you have to share. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to Maria. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you everybody for, for joining today. I'm, I'm delighted to speak about uh, the book that I published on cyber criminology with Oxford University Press. Um, next slide, please. So today's presentation um, will cover my book, but I, I want to start first by talking about the, my general research motivation, what inspires me. Uh, to publish within the, in this particular topic and, of course, other related topics. Um, I'll go over the motivation for the specific book that I have published. I'll cover some of the topics that are covered in the book. Uh, but I'd like to spend a good portion of the presentation focused on two topics uh, that uh, require further attention. Uh, they're understudied topics and, and hopefully um, I can inspire uh, research uh, within this space following um, the introduction of uh, these uh, concepts, these topics, and um, what is known uh, about them, and of course, uh, what is unknown. And I'm um, and the two topics that I'm referring to are cyber organized crime and and darknet. Next slide. So before I introduce my book, um, I'd like to talk about. Uh, what motivates me uh, to focus on cybercrime and, and counter cybercrime efforts. I'm fascinated by dig digital technology. Uh, digital technology and the internet have really transformed the ways in which individuals communicate, the way they interact, form relationships, learn, even play, share information, move money, and conduct businesses. Individuals from anywhere in the world can, with the help of digital technology and the internet, reach and affect people around the globe. Cyber criminals have leveraged this technology to commit cyber dependent crimes, which are crimes that target the confidentiality, the integrity and availability of systems, networks and data, and to commit basically crimes that would not have been possible with the ad without the advent of technology. And of course, cyber enabled crimes, which are the traditional crimes that are facilitated by the Internet and digital technology. The tactics, the targets, the tools, the methods of operation of these cyber criminals continuously to continuously evolve really to adapt um, to the criminal justice and security measures that are implemented. Now, this evolution results in a reshaping of the cyber threat and cyber risk landscape. So my research is really designed to help uh, an array of individuals, students, academics, criminal justice agents, practitioners, and policy policymakers 
really recognize this changing landscape and to help them really keep up pace with evolving cyber threats and risks. Next slide, please. So before I discuss my book, I think it's important to, to you know, t define basically what, what cyber criminology is. Um, so when I use the term cyber criminology, I'm referring to the scientific study of cyber crime that tests the applicability of mainstream theories to cyber crimes that seek to shed light on the nature and extent of cyber crime, assess reactions to cyber crime and the implications of these reactions and that evaluate the efficacy of existing methods that are used to control, mitigate, and even prevent cybercrime. So I published this book um, to really spark interest in the field of cyber criminology and to stimulate criminological thought and debate on cybercrime. With this book, I really wanted to draw attention to the lack of data and empirical studies in this field to motivate educators to update curriculum, to include cyber criminology, and to increase research contributions in this field. Currently, there is a serious deficit in national counter cyber crime and cybersecurity capacity worldwide. In part for this reason, there, there is a need to advance knowledge in the field of cyber crime and cybersecurity and to enhance existing education programs in these areas. And one way this can be done is through the inclusion of cyber related material, such as the, the studies on cyber crime, in the curriculum of non STEM disciplines, meaning uh, those outside of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, such as social science and humanities. And really, the deficit in national capacity is particularly problematic, given the fact that today, few things personal and professional have been left untouched by uh, information and communication technology. The world's increasing reliance on information and communication technology has greatly expanded uh, vulnerabilities to cybercrime. And new technologies that continue to be developed increase vulnerabilities to cybercrime by creating more connection between devices, uh, which enable the transfer of data in real time anywhere in the world with an internet connection. Uh, the need to educate the workforce and the next generation of professionals is even more pressing because of this. My book is international in scope. Uh, it introduces readers to criminological theories, as I mentioned before, types of cyber crimes and the nature and extent of cyber crime. And while the book's primary target audience are students at academic institutions, and it has practical exercises, case studies, and review questions for this reason, uh, the book is really designed to appeal to a wider audience uh, because it critically explores cyber crime, theories of cyber crime, countermeasures, and their implications for a number of different fields, both uh, technological and non-technology uh, fields, criminology, criminal justice, uh, law, computer science, psychology, sociology, and political science, to name a few. Uh, frankly, anyone that's interested in learning about cyber crime and the causes of cyber crime and national and international responses to it can find food for thought in this work. Next slide, please. So the book um, overall um, it explores really this complex subject of cyber criminology and looks at measurements, impacts, causes, and reactions to cyber crimes, um, as well as these significant theories and perspectives of criminology and how they relate to specific cyber crimes um, and the measures that are actually needed to control this uh, type of crime. Uh, the layout of the book is designed to introduce cybercrime and related concepts and the causes of cybercrime before the approaches to cybercrime, uh, meaning the countermeasures are considered. Um, and uh, there, the reason for laying the book out in this manner is to ensure that readers can critically examine responses to cybercrime um, while considering whether or not these responses are grounded in theory and are designed to deal with the cyber crimes targeted by, by these measures. 
Now the book is broken down in three parts. Uh, the first part really is, serves as an introduction on cybercrime, different cybercrime concepts and cyber criminology, and covers some key thematic concerns um, in the field of cyber criminology. Uh, one such key thematic concern is how to measure cybercrime. Um, and particularly um, th in this part of the book, the methods and the instruments that are used to collect and analyze cybercrime data are explored. Now this da data is particularly essential um, to understanding not only the nature and extent of cybercrime, but also cyber offenders and, and, and cyber victims slash target patterns and trends. Um, this data not only sheds light on trends and patterns, but can also inform public policies and efforts to control, mitigate, and respond to, and even prevent cybercrime. Next slide, please. Uh, the second part of the book is devoted to discussing an array of theories in various fields and examining how they relate to specific cybercrimes. Now, the chapters listed on the slide really provide an in-depth analysis of the existing literature and empirical studies on cybercrime and identify gaps in literature and research. Um, these chapters contain theories, literature, and research um, that are used to inform criminal justice and security policies and practices. The body of work uh, covers theories and perspectives that view crime and cybercrime as an outcome of free choice, as influenced by seductions and repulsions of illicit acts, as a result of internal and external forces that are believed to be responsible for cybercrime, either completely or serving as an undue influence. They view crime and cybercrime as an outcome of predispositions to commit illicit acts, as an illness or pathology that needs to be cured, as attributed to the structural conditions in society, such as poverty and inequality. Other theories um, view crime and cybercrime as a learned behavior, as influenced by class, render, uh, excuse me, by class, gender, and race. Other, other theories that are examined within this part of the book focus not on criminality, on criminality per se, but on explaining why and how individuals drift in and out of criminal behavior, while other theories focus on why people conform, even though they are subjected to temptations, to pressures, and to inducements to commit illegal acts. This section of the book also explores how cybercrime is socially constructed through labels and reactions to crime. You know, societal reactions to cybercrime and even cyber deviance, the latter of which involves the use of information and communication technology to engage in conduct that violates social norms and expectations that may or may not be illegal, um, really influence, affect, and shape them. Um, specifically, this body of work uh, demonstrates that societal reactions such as criminal labels, shaming, and sanctions influence and impact offenders' behaviors and shape their identities. Uh, overall, uh, my research uh, in this part identified a dearth in academic cybercrime literature and research and really pointed to the need to continue to advance knowledge in this field through quantitative and qualitative studies on various forms of cybercrime. Uh, theories and empirical studies are, are, are an important part of this discipline. You know, understanding the causes of and factors influencing cybercrime um, are essential to choosing the appropriate measures to respond to it. And policymakers need to take these causes and factors into consideration uh, when they're identifying possible courses of action against cybercrime and choosing the most appropriate course of action. Next slide, please. The last part of the book examine the, the courses, uh, courses of actions that I just mentioned, um, and specifically covers um, certain classifications or typologies of cybercrime um, and the measures implemented to counter them. 
So the book identifies six general typologies, and underneath each general category, certain cyber crimes uh, were were discussed. Um, the six typologies that were identified include interpersonal cyber crimes, cyber trespass, cyber theft, deviant cyber acts, and public order cyber crimes. Um, organized cyber crime, or as we've now um, come to term it, cyber organized crime, and political cyber crime. I'm briefly going to discuss what each typology is before um, I explain the the results of this analysis and what it showed. Um, from the six typologies, the first one is interpersonal cybercrime. Now, with, underneath this category, the, the types of crimes that are included are those that are committed through the use of information and communication technology against an individual with which the perpetrator of the crime is communicating with or has some form of relationship with, either real or imagined. Um, these types of cyber crimes can involve family members, intimate partners, community members, classmates, acquaintances, even strangers. Um, examples of interpersonal cyber crimes are cyber stalking, sextortion, technology facilitated violence such as image-based sexual abuse, and uh, online child sexual exploitation and child sexual abuse. Um, second uh, typology, cyber trespass, uh, involves the use of information and communication technology to gain unauthorized access into computer systems, networks, and data. Um, these, the crime, the cyber crimes uh, under this typology are the cyber dependent crimes, those that would not be possible without technology. Um, once unauthorized access is gained, uh, perpetrators may copy, alter, delete, damage, destroy or disrupt um, systems and networks. Um, and of course, uh, when we're talking about damage or deletion or alteration or copying, we're referring to data. So this, the cyber crimes that fall under this category and some examples of them include hacking, malware, in, uh, malware distribution, and um, distributed denial of service attacks. The third typology is cyber theft, and this involves the stealing of personal information, medical information, financial information, through the use and money, uh, through the use of information and communication technologies. Uh, the data and money can be obtained through hacking, malware distribution, and online scams that really seek to trick targets into providing personal information, which can be used by the perpetrator to conduct fraud. Other examples of cyber crimes in this category are phishing and intellectual uh, property crime. The fourth category, deviant cyber acts and public order crimes, uh, involve deviant and criminal behaviors that are viewed as acts that offend public shared norms, morals, values, and customs. Uh, these acts are deemed immoral by certain jurisdictions because they violate accepted codes of conduct. Examples can include uh, paraphilias, anything from paraphilias to uh, internet gambling. Views on the legality, though, of uh, these deviant cyber acts and public order crimes vary across jurisdictions. Um, the fifth typology is political cyber crime. Uh, political cyber crime um, refers to cyber crime that's committed by individuals, groups, or mission states in furtherance of some political goal or agenda. Um, these types of criminals engage in hacking, malware distribution, uh, distributed denial of service attacks, among other cyber crimes, um, in order to cause some form of interference with systems. Uh, the targets, tactics, the modus operandi, the, modus operandi, um, the motives, the uh, intent, are all examined um, to determine what type of cyber threat um, it is. Um, sometimes the tactics, the targets, and, and even the, the method of operation of these particular um, uh, individuals or, or groups, uh, excuse me, uh, of these individuals or groups might be similar in nature, 
what distinguishes these perpetrators is really motive and intent. So example of political cyber crimes can be hacktivism or cyber, cyber espionage. Uh, the sixth category, the sixth typology is organized cyber crime and cyber organized crime. Um, since I'm going to spend uh, a portion of the presentation talking about it, I will not discuss it here. What I want to say about this particular part of the book, uh, particularly regarding the analysis of the typologies, um, is that my review of countermeasures uh, found uh, an array of, of measures that are implemented to deal with cybercrime from laws and policies, the enforcement of laws and policies, investigations and prosecutions, technological solutions, and um, primary and secondary prevention programs. Um, what was observed, however, were there that was that there were significant gaps in practices uh, across jurisdictions and even within jurisdictions. Um, for this reason, the, this section of the book was dedicated to not only identifying these gaps, but also recommending ways to improve existing practices and harmonize approaches across jurisdictions. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit more in the next part of this presentation on, on two topics, two particular topics of interest. Um, next slide, please. One of which is cyber organized crime. Uh, currently, there's no consensus uh, on a definition of cyber organized crime in the same manner as there's no consensus in the definition of organized crime. Um, despite uh, the lack of consensus, um, what I will, I, will, I will use the definition that was recently provided by the case digest of cyber organized crime, um, the image of which is displayed uh, on this slide. Um, in order to ensure that there's a level of consistency uh, in terminology and use of terminology. Um, what we often find within the field of cyber criminology is that there are various terms that are used. And by using different terms, it diverts energy and focus away from the study of, of the particular cyber crime that we are describing. And of course, using different terms also undermines the efforts to measure the nature and extent of cyber crime. So using the term uh, cyber organized crime uh, and the definition, I will explain what it is, right? Uh, using the, the same term in the definition that's provided by UNODC, um, you, it, it, the, the term cyber organized crime uh, refers to cyber crime committed uh, by an organized criminal group that involves an offense which criminalizes participation in an organized criminal group. Now, there are a few elements that I want to unpack here. Um, one is the cyber crime element. Um, for the particular crime to be considered a form of cyber organized crime, there must be a cyber element. So either a cyber dependent crime has to be committed or a cyber enabled crime. Uh, for the cyber crime that is being committed to, con uh, to be considered this cyber organized crime, one of two elements need to be present. Uh, an organized criminal group or participation in an organized criminal group. The latter really involves offenses that are listed under Article 5 of the UN Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. Uh, these include conspiracy and, and criminal association. The former element, the, the organized criminal group, is defined uh, by Article 2A of the Convention um, as a structured group of three or more persons existing for a period of time and acting in concert with the aim of committing one or more serious crimes or offenses that are established in accordance with this convention in order to obtain directly or indirectly a financial or other material benefit. I would like to draw your attention to a few terms in the definition. The structured group um, that's mentioned in the definition 
who really can apply to loosely affiliated groups without any formally defined roles for its members or developed structure. The period of time requirement that's included in this definition has been interpreted as any period of time. The term serious crime is not defined in the convention by criminal activity, but by the penalty instead. Um, the convention defines serious crime as conduct that constitutes a, an offense that's punishable uh, by a maximum deprivation of liberty of at least four years uh, or more serious penalty. The last requirement that I'd like to talk about in the definition of an organized uh, criminal group is the requirement that the illicit act be committed in order to obtain some form of financial or material benefit. Uh, the term other material benefit is not limited to financially related or, or equivalent benefits. Um, it has been interpreted broadly and can even include uh, personal benefits um, uh, and can also include personal benefits um, such as uh, sexual gratification. Um, to sum up, cyber organized crime is a cyber crime that's committed by an organized criminal group uh, which involves an offense that criminalizes participation in the organized uh, criminal group. Next slide, please. Information, what do we know about uh, cyber organized crime? We know that information and community, uh, excuse me, in information and communications technology has really transformed it. Uh, any, anywhere from the types of activities that are committed by um, groups that engage in cyber organized, in, by organized, cyber organized crime, to the types of individuals who participate in organized crime, to the ways that groups are structured and organized uh, ranging from hierarchical structures with some form of centralization, division of labor, and identifiable leaders to more transient or loosely affiliated decentralized networks. Uh, we know that cyber organized crime, uh, that individuals that engage in cyber organized crime leverage information and communication technology to illicitly obtain personal and financial information with the intention of committing some form of fraud or theft. Uh, they conduct intellectual property crime. They use malicious software with the intention of stealing information for later use to engage in a subsequent criminal activity uh, like extortion or identity theft. Um, they sell data. They hacking and malware products and services for a fee. Um, they engage in cyber and they engage in cyber enabled money laundering. These types of groups um, also often operate under a crime as a service model. Um, and what, is they, what does that mean? It means that these groups offer a variety of services that facilitate virtually any cyber crime. Next slide, please. So some example of the services uh, that are provided by uh, groups that, by individuals, by groups that engage in cyber organized crime. Uh, are the provision of stolen data, uh, malicious software toolkits and services to engage in attacks, <coughs> hacking services, paper install services, and infrastructure which cyber criminals can protect, um, can be can use to protect uh, illicit goods and services and launch cyber attacks. So stolen data is offered because it's a highly sought, out, uh, sought after commodity online. Um, individuals that engage in cyber organized crime sell this data en masse. This data is bought and sold uh, online and on various sites. Um, the type of information that is sold includes personal data, financial data, health data, and online credentials, uh, banking credentials, or other online account, uh, account data like social networking sites, gaming, uh, gaming accounts, and so on. These individuals also offer malicious software toolkits and services. Um, particularly, they offer something known as malware as a service. Uh, those engaging in these service um, operate like a legitimate software developer and distributor with uh, troubleshooting services and customer care to enable users 
um, that utilize these, these illicit products uh, to use them more effectively and efficiently. Uh, individuals can purchase a wide variety of services for a fee. Some examples of this malware are crimeware and crypto ransomware. Uh, crimeware is really malware that's designed to facilitate a cyber crime and can be modified to users' needs with respect to language and currency. And cryptocurrency encrypts data on target systems and and extorts money. And 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 excuse me. And the perpetrators can use this uh, uh, software to extort money from targets to release information or to enable them to regain uh, system use uh, and access. So malware as a service offerings can be made to order. Um, they can target a specific group, person, or critical infrastructure. I, it depends on the customer's wants and needs. Or they can be off the shelf. Um, they can offer ransomware and botnets that are ready for use upon purchase. Um, the malware as a service really has drastically reduced barriers to entry into this cybercrime market by enabling a wide variety of persons and groups um, to utilize these services with varying degrees of uh, technical knowledge, skills, and abilities. Um, other uh, forms of malicious software that are offered are uh, exploit toolkits, which are sold to, to take advantage of existing vulnerabilities in software. These groups also provide hacking services um, and even hacking as a service. So members of the group or network um, are hired to hack into a target's accounts in order to surreptitiously access the account and um, either uh, obtain or, or modify data. Uh, these hacking services uh, may be for multiple users and may involve uh, a, a wide variety of illicit activities beyond those um, involving um, illegal data access. Uh, groups also offer paper install, uh, paper install services, which really are where members of the group or network get paid each time a user downloads malware or accesses a site with malware. Finally, these groups offer um, that they provide hosting services for a fee um, to enable users to store illicit goods and services and utilize them to attack targets. Uh, examples of sought-after infrastructure services include bulletproof ho hosting, which is a service that allows users to upload content and promises not to remove users' content even if it's illegal, and proxy servers, which is an intermediate server that enables indirect access to content um, to the content of other servers. Uh, this infrastructure is, is promoted and advertised as protecting users from detection by law enforcement authorities. Uh, next slide. In addition to crimes as a service, um, these groups have also engaged in cyber-enabled trafficking operations um, involving humans, drugs, firearms, wildlife, cultural property, and of course other forms of trafficking on both clearnet and darknet sites. Now the slides, um, uh, please forgive me for this, the slides are, are purposely small. They're not meant to, to be viewed. Um, they're just meant as an illustration to show some of the sites that are out there um, that uh, advertise um, illicit goods and services. So um, I mentioned earlier ClearNet and DarkNet sites. For reference, ClearNet is compromised of a collection of index sites that users can find through traditional search engines like Google or Bing. Um, darknet is an umbrella term that is used to describe websites within the deep web. And the deep web is made up of a collection of non-index sites that cannot be identified and accessed through these uh, traditional clear net uh, search engines. Um, just uh, to place this into context, Deep Web not only includes the websites that are part of Darknet, but um, also includes websites that are uh, password protected and intranets as well. So ClearNet and Darknet has provided um, organized, uh, cyber organized criminal groups with spaces to commit cyber crimes with a degree of anonymity, to exploit gaps in the legal system around the world, to conduct cyber operations, and to attack targets anywhere in the world. 
um, ClearNet and DarkNet are used to advertise, sell, and rent illicit goods and services. Websites and online marketplaces offer illicit goods and services uh, that offer illicit goods and services are also marketed on ClearNet websites. An example of this is the now defunct uh, Deep.Web, which had marketed and provided direct links um, from ClearNet to illicit darknet marketplaces. Uh, these goods, these illicit goods and services are also marketed on social media platforms um, and even search engines. Um, as depicted in the slide, um, these organized criminal groups uh, use websites and other online platforms to illegally market sex trafficking victims and use legitimate online marketplaces to advertise anything from cultural property to wildlife. On these marketplaces, counterfeit goods, wildlife, and other illegal goods um, sometimes are even presented as genuine or they're mixed with genuine goods. Uh, the illicit goods and services are, are not only offered on clearnet sites, but also darknet sites like the defunct sites that are included in the slide, um, Silk Road and Wall Street Market. Um, Silk Road was well known for being a prominent uh, darknet uh, drug marketplace. Wall Street, uh, Wall Street Market also provided, uh, and, and Silk Road is depicted on the left, the top left uh, side of the slide. Uh, right below it is um, the, uh, sorry, on the other side, on the right hand side uh, at the bottom of the slide um, is Wall Street Market. And Wall Street Market, while it also provided um, drugs, illicit drugs. Uh, it offered other services, other, other types of goods as well, um, including digital goods, counterfeit goods, money, um, and even bulletproof hosting that I mentioned earlier uh, by offering servers and countries that purportedly served as cybercrime safe havens um, and offered the use of servers to legally host uh, content without the threat of removal. Uh, before it was shut down in April 2019 by German authorities, Wall Street Market was the world's second largest dark market, um, which enabled the trade in drugs, stolen data, and fake documents, and malicious software. Next slide, please. So what can be learned by uh, studying spaces like Silk Road, uh, Wall Street Market, and, and other dark net markets as well. Um, these sites actually can provide rich information about the types of illicit goods and services offered in the space, the tools that actors use to commit crimes and cyber crimes, behavioral patterns of groups um, and networks um, can be identified on these uh, sites, um, as, especially through their tactics, techniques, and procedures, and what can also be gleaned from the sites is the extent to which knowledge is shared between group, uh, groups and members of these sites. Not only knowledge about illicit goods and services, but knowledge about security practices to evade detection uh, by law enforcement authorities. Next slide. Research is needed to, to identify what makes these dark net markets attractive uh, or unattractive uh, for cyber organized crime. Um, especially given the fact that these are high risk environments. Uh, darknet sites have experienced law enforcement raids and seizures of their sites. There have been predatory darknet sites that have stolen uh, the cryptocurrencies that were deposited on the sites. Um, these sites have experienced cyber attacks in the form of hacking to steal cryptocurrencies from vendors and buyers to distribute a denial of service attacks to take these sites offline. Packages that have been mailed with illicit goods uh, are vulnerable to law enforcement detection and border security agency interception. Um, vendors have also been known to keep customer lists with addresses. Uh, when these vendors were arrested, uh, case law revealed that the buyers of their products were revealed during those investigations of the vendors. And despite all of this, despite the theft, cybercrime, a high risk of law enforcement attention and possible arrest, these darknet markets persist. Not on the same site that was taken down, 
but they start to rebuild and ultimately flourish on other sites. Uh, in fact, there has been an exponential growth of darknet markets since the takedown of Silk Road, not only in terms of the number of sites, but also the number of users and listings of illicit goods and services. Uh, the creator of the site, Ross Albright, um, the creator of Silk Road, was sentenced to life imprisonment in the United States for his role. And other administrators of darknet sites and even vendors have received lengthy prison sentences. And even with these sentences and law enforcement takedown of Silk Road and other darknet markets, these markets and cyber organized crime activities within this space persist. And a, a very important research question is to identify the factors that account for this persistence and growth. Um, next slide, please. And, and overall, um, research not only within the space of darknet, but also cyber organized crime is, is piecemeal. And, and future research is needed in, and in the space of cyber organized crime to identify the organizations, the structures, the roles, the tactics, the targets, and the methods of operation of these groups, as well as the gender of leaders and group members, and the extent to which these groups operate online. Is it exclusive, is it predominantly? Um, is it a mix of online and offline? Um, or is it predominantly offline? Um, these are factors that we need to further explore. Um, there is still much that is also unknown about darknet sites, and the activities that occur within the space. Uh, most of the existing research focuses on sites that have been taken down. Silk Road, Alpha Bay, um, and other darknet markets. Um, and they analyze data uh, that is obtained from other research projects and open source data about darknet sites and content, and they analyze content that is made available by researchers. New data is needed within the space. Um, darknet sites are in a constant state of flux. The types of goods and services, the demand, the supply, the interactions, um, and the identification of major players, the vendors on darknet sites, and the top uh, darknet sites at any moment uh, frequently change. Uh, the sites themselves may not be up for long. The rate of this change often exceeds uh, security, cybersecurity, and criminal justice professionals' ability to keep up with these changes. Uh, next slide, please. Research on darknet and cyber organized crime uh, can assist in the identification of cyber threats and vulnerabilities, the tools used to exploit uh, vulnerabilities, and novel ways in which information and communication technology are used to commit cyber organized crime, uh, which ultimately helps students, academics, criminal justice agents, practitioners, and policymakers keep pace with these evolving uh, cyber threats and cyber risks. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, next slide, please. I will wait for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I, I love the last slide, by the way. It's great. <laughs> um, um, I, I bought it from a cartoon stock. I think it's important to invest in the intellectual property of others. But yes, it was an interesting and very pertinent slide. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. I, I actually have a question. I mean, it's so slippery, as you were pointing out, uh, managing or even following what's going on in the cybercrime world and especially on the the dark markets um, how do you feel countries are faring legislatively in terms of adapting to how to criminalize i mean i mean there are clear things if you're doing you know trafficking but there are new crimes that i think maybe we don't have the tools in place even in the sense of when it goes to court how do you prosecute it? And I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit, you know, from your experience, what the legislative landscape is, how it's evolving around cyber crime and how to deal with it. Um, no, a great question, thank you. Uh, so there are 
cybercrime substantive and procedural laws that have been implemented um, that relate to cybercrime in certain jurisdictions. Others have taken the approach of applying more traditional laws to interpret uh, cybercrime. Really where the space that needs the greatest attention is, is not necessarily the creation of new laws except in the jurisdictions that do not have these laws in place, but more so the harmonization of laws. Uh, because cybercrime rarely remains within what we would consider traditional borders within a jurisdiction. So this harmonization is extremely important because without this harmonization, um, international cooperation with this space is challenged, right? And most of, and many of the actual uh, cases that I described, especially within the space of, of Darknet, involved international cooperation, which relied on the use of domestic uh, legislation and, of course, regional and international instruments that facilitated this cooperation. With respect to prosecution, there's another issue uh, that's at stake, and that's the, the need for cybercrime training amongst criminal justice professionals, not only in terms of cybercrime proper, broadly defined, but specifically drilling down and the topic that I decided to focus on on cyber organized crime. Um, the digest that was recently published by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime really highlights how difficult it is to pinpoint cyber organized crime within these cases and really the differentiation that existed between the, the manner in which these cases were dealt with and even the, the, the forms of punishment uh, that were uh, provided for these um, cyber crimes. Thank you. Um, I'll open up the floor. People seem to be shy while you were talking to interrupt, but I'll give them a chance now. If you'd like to raise your hand or use the chat to ask any questions, please go ahead. Um, yeah, I just find the whole topic so fascinating and, and the level of different types of crime. Um, like when you think about somebody immobilizing a hospital versus your common, you know, cyber stalking, which, you know, even boring Joe Blow might be guilty of, you know, um, finding out about an ex. So they, the variety of crimes covered under this umbrella are is really so immense. Um, and yeah, I just find it such an incredible challenge to start breaking down, you know, how you want to deal. But when you start getting into the organized crime, and I think that's where you really see the you know, what we've seen with the, the hacking of hospitals and really debilitating sorts of crimes that um, ruin infrastructure. I think those are particularly terrifying. But And the interesting thing is you pinpointed uh, with the hacking of, interest, uh, of infrastructure, it's the same tools that are used, right? The same tools, hacking, malware distribution, what really changes is motive, intent, and target, and that really lets us know what type of cyber crime we're dealing with, and of course, the seriousness of a, a particular act, uh, which is why focusing on behavior and understanding perpetrators is extremely important within this space, right? Not only the protection, the physical protection of infrastructure and cybersecurity measures that are implemented, you know, personnel, physical security, and cybersecurity, but also really understanding what motivates and drives offenders, right? Um, because focusing just on the practical applications is is not enough. We need to understand the driving forces behind them so we can appropriately uh, put forward the measures, the policies and practices needed to deal um, with these types of threats. Absolutely. I have a question here from Jean-Luc. Go ahead, Jean-Luc. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Um, so many interesting and fascinating aspects within cybercrime. Um, we do see that the national community is now heading for an international convention. I mean, what is your thinking on that one? I mean, what, how do you see that evolving? How uh, are the prospects I mean, to have that coming out in a manner which you would prescribe as being useful? I think so. so 
one of the things that we're, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Um, in order to facilitate this harmonization, uh, in order to facilitate international cooperation, we need to harmonize our approaches. Um, and to date, there have been efforts uh, with regional instruments that have been implemented. And of course, we have the, the Convention on Cybercrime that has been implemented, but more needs to be done because we need to ensure that there is a level of harmonization of not only the, the laws that we have, but also the effective enforcement of it. So coming to the table and discussing the need to create such a measure to facilitate that cooperation and step in the right direction. Thank you. Um, there's a another question. It's not in the chat here, but uh, is there a difference in the psychology of criminals involved in cybercrime and other types of crime? What information exists on that? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, the literature that focused on trait theories on cybercrime was limited in terms of the type of cyber criminals um, that the literature was focused on. The studies that I was able to identify uh, predominantly focused on hacking and um, actually predominantly it was online uh, child sex offenders and then to a lesser extent hacking. Um, but there wasn't this larger body of work, which is why I identify that there is a, a gap here, right, in terms of, of really identifying how trait theories apply to larger studies. There's also a body of work that has been applied to the notions of addiction with respect to technology. Um, and these are particularly interesting studies that have focused within the space of uh, obviously psychology and traditional addiction studies, gambling, and substance abuse. Uh, but beyond those, the focus has been uh, quite limited in that space. Um, but parallels have been drawn obviously to the traditional crimes and those crimes that have really been facilitated and enabled uh, by information and communication technology. No, thank you. Yeah, I think it's it's a whole new sort of wild west in terms of how we can, yes, perpetrate crimes, offend people, etc. And the, the issue that we have now is that worldwide, um, there are so many of us who use technology on a day to day basis and really aren't aware of, of the risks and it, it points to the importance of really educating the public, practitioners, and really understanding the significance of this particular um, of crime. Because th this situ what we're experiencing now is only going to exponentially expand. We have the Internet of Things, everyday devices that are now being connected to the Internet, from appliances to security systems to everything in your home. We have emerging technologies like artificial intelligence also that are being deployed uh, by companies, by uh, agencies as well. And, and we have yet to keep up pace with the more basic technology. So now is the time to get ahead and, and try to, to facilitate this, this knowledge sharing within this space. And of course, to, to push these efforts uh, to provide this training. Oh, absolutely. I'm also thinking, you know, we had a discussion when we were setting up this meeting about downloading teams and uh, I very much uh, agree with Maria The, you know, for those of us that are a little cyber paranoid, the uh, the lack of trust with downloading apps is also something that kind of plays into how we might, you know, be able to maintain our own security. It looks like Rika has a question. Go ahead, Rika. Thanks very much and thank you, Maria, for the great presentation. Uh, we continue tomorrow together. Um, I wanted to ask you, actually, um, since the negotiations of the Cybercrime Convention are now ongoing, what do you think should be covered in such a convention from an academic point of view? So I think that before we even get to that stage of, of focusing on inclusion, I think the really important first step is really to identify um, 
what we already have in place to really drill down and see the existing me measures that are in place to drill down on the obstacles um, that have been experienced by, by nations worldwide in terms of um, coordination and cooperation, fleshing those issues out to ensure that the treaty that is being discussed now complements existing efforts, but also moves forward in a manner that facilitates international cooperation and coordination. Um, I feel that in order to, to be successful, taking that into account, as well as taking account um, what the literature tells us about factors, these driving factors, right, that exist for cybercrime um, are extremely important, right? To develop a possible, uh, to develop a good course of action, what we need to do is first set the scene and really identify what the issue is, how pervasive it is, right? What are the factors that contribute to this to then determine how the treaty can actually assist in what we've identified. I hope this is, I hope this answers your question. <laughs> I mentioned the app, and I think uh, that's an important uh, issue that I, I would like to discuss. Um, when we download these apps um, and provide information to the apps, our, our phones, our technological device, any type of smart device that you have is designed to uh, basically communicate information between apps. So usage, and other type of data is shared amongst apps that you have within your own phone. So it's extremely phone or other uh, smart device. So it's extremely important to read the terms of service and, and understand the extent to which data is collected. Uh, many of the terms of services include third parties, which are really broad and can mean basically anybody in, in business operations. So uh, it's worth noting that um, creating more of a uh, hesitant approach to adoption before checking, before, excuse me, downloading is extremely important. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that's all we have. I think it's just Wendy that still has her hand up, but we can't hear her. So um, I'm sure if there are further questions. Oh. Okay. Ah, there she is. Okay. My question relates to future threats. You did touch on the challenges and response uh, given the agility of those that engage in cybercrime, the challenges of harmonizing legislation, etc. You also spoke eloquently about international cooperation research. Are there other ways in which we can foresee future threats and respond in advance? Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I can use an example of an area that we, we can foresee future threats, and, and I mentioned it's the Internet of Things. Um, and uh, honestly, the way moving forward within this space is providing these minimum, not minimum, good, uh, privacy and security protections within these devices um, and ensuring that uh, there's a level of accountability for um, technological devices that are um, basically deployed on the market that have these vulnerabilities in place. There have been efforts in, in, in countries, I know in, in the U.S., uh, there have been attempts to, to pass specific Internet of Things legislation really focused on just government adoption, but not thinking about the fact that in order to, you know, harm can be caused by, by the average citizen adopting that same technology and um, threat actors using it. We've seen in the past that uh, there have been threat actors that have deployed distributed denial of service attacks on Internet of Things devices. So the printer, think about your home appliances, because those really are the devices that don't have the same level of protection as your computer might have. And of course, that access is gained to the, the device that is not as secure. Um, and these are things that we can start thinking about. Uh, ways to anticipate these types of threats, have preparedness plans in place. Um, really within the space of cybercrime, what we should, I mean, we should, ideally we would like prevention. Realistically, what we can have is mitigation. 
So as long as we continue these conversations, as long as we identify these risks, and as long as we have these plans in place to respond um, to these types of uh, threats when they materialize, we can stay at least in pace with the threats as they evolve. No, absolutely. And speaking of that, you think of some of the the possibilities with technology interfacing with health, so pacemakers, and that gets very, very terrifying. Yes, and um, and you mentioned that it's all we've already had pacemaker data introduced in a U.S. court as evidence of insurance and arson fraud, believe it or not. Um, so we've already started to see that even within medical devices, that data, that personal data, is already introduced in courts of law as evidence of crime. And of course, we haven't yet fleshed out what the limitations are to the use of this data and the circumstances where it can be used. So these are spaces that we need to be involved in as well. Thank you so much, Maria. I've really enjoyed speaking and hearing you speak uh, today. And um, thank you to all of our guests who've joined us. We went a few minutes over time, uh, but I think it was really worth it. And uh, yes, we will uh, let people know when there's a recording available. And till next time, again, thank you. We've really been, a, it's been a treat for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you all for joining. Take care.